Hello, everybody, and welcome to Unit 3, Dementia. The strange sentence to make, isn't it? It's, welcome to Dementia. First of all, look, look me. I figured out mouse control. Ha, ah, it's already gone. So remember last time, I guess, first of all, before we do the recap, heads up on this one, an apology. You might want to take some pauses in here. This is the longest, beefiest lecture in the course. So I guess it's a good news, bad news thing, depending on how you look at it. The bad news is, this is the longest one. The good news is, we're at the peak of the mountain now. So everything is just shady downhill from here on in. So remember last time we talked about psychological disorders. And psychological disorders are a combination of imbalances of neurochemicals, maladaptive behavior, and cultural influences. Some combination of those is the R, I guess, bad, bad language there, are the cause of psychological disorders, we think. As opposed to that, we actually have a much better grasp on what's going on with dementia. Dementia is a disorder of mental processes due to physical brain damage. Now, when I say brain damage, I don't mean a patient got knocked on the head and suffered brain damage. This, well, what we mean in this case is progressive damage from disease. The uh, dementia is marked by uh, memory disorders, personality changes, and impaired reasoning. It can be thought of as chronic brain disease, and we'll go into that more in a minute here. So how common is dementia? Well, with the age group we're working with, more common than any, uh, anywhere else. You can see on the table here, 2% uh, of patients that are 65 to 69 present with signs and symptoms of dementia. By the time that somebody's 90, over 33% of them present with some signs and symptoms. So dementia is directly correlated, directly positively correlated to age. So what is it? There's it earlier, it's, a, it's physical damage. It's a physical breakdown of part a part or parts of the brain. All forms of dementia are progressive, incurable, and fatal. There are multiple types. The ones we're going to be discussing are Alzheimer's, frontal temporal, Lewy body, and vascular. The differences are what part of the brain is, B, is, is degenerating and how it presents. And those are directly linked together. Uh, dementias can be thought of as syndromes in that there are a cluster of signs and symptoms that are initially what leads to a diagnosis of dementia. Previously, that was about it because there was a time when you had to really go in and look at somebody's brain, open them up, uh, you know, uh, autopsy the brain, and the uh, eagle-eyed viewer is going to note that that's a little bit fatal. So... It was just kind of a proposed diagnosis based on signs and symptoms until the person passed away. Uh, now, through with PET scans, MRIs, we can actually look at it. We can see the brain damage in real time. So, uh, ironically, now that it's easier to diagnose specific dementias, the trend is to not diagnose a specific dementia anymore. Um, the therapy, the treatment for dementia is generally the same regardless of what type it is. And much like protein calorie malnutrition, although there are different types and they do present differently and they do mean different things, I don't see the diagnosis as often. So I don't often see somebody diagnosed with Alzheimer's so much as I'll see them diagnosed with dementia with behaviors. So bear that in mind that when we're talking about this, there may be different forms and may present differently, but the treatment in all aspects, including nutritional um, interventions that are taken really don't change depending on the type of dementia. So I guess uh, there might be a viable question is, does this really matter? Eh, like, no one's going to ask the dietitian for a diagnosis on dementia, but this is such a prevalent condition for older patients. It's definitely worth having some familiarity with. So very quickly, let's talk about tau pathies. Um, tau pathies are... I don't want to say responsible. They're linked to most forms of dementia. And the reason I don't want to say that, that they're cause of is because we're really not sure the degree to which tau pathies are linked. 
we know they are somehow because there are a lot more um, tau tangles. Tau tangles are a tangle form of protein that are found in the brain. They are a natural waste product. In tau pathies, they are. There's a lot more. There are much more of them. They're more frequently found. And so right now we don't really understand if tau tangles are a cause of dementia, if they are a side effect of dementia, or if they're a symptom of dementia. We don't know how they're linked. We know that they are linked. Um, it's a very, very brief description there of how it occurs. Again, is that super important? Eh, from a nutrition standpoint, probably not. But it is worth noting that this... this this is where we think we're going with this, but it's not very well understood yet. Okay, Alzheimer's is far and away the most common type of dementia you're going to be working with. It's um, the most common form. 60 to 80% of patients have that have dementia have Alzheimer's. It's about 6 million cases as of 2020. So 50% present solely with Alzheimer's pathology. So just kind of very quick back of the math or back of the envelope math you can see that how much of the how much of the patient population with dementia just has has alzheimer's alone now remember hickam's dictum hickam's dictum that uh patient can have as many conditions as they damn well please so not everybody with with alzheimer's only has alzheimer's you can have more than one type and again uh, it's a, it is a tau pathy, so it's associated with tau tangles and also beta amyloid plaque buildup. And again, we don't know if this is the cause of Alzheimer's, if this is a symptom or a side effect. We're not sure. Alzheimer's has a very very slow progression. Um, it's estimated that about a diagnosis happens for about three and a half to five and a half years from the onset of symptoms. So. It, that's how slow it progresses, that um, it takes that long from the time somebody starts showing symptoms to the time that somebody gets a diagnosis. It was previously diagnosed from symptom clusters, and the severity of classification of Alzheimer's is still done this way. You can now diagnose it with uh, dyed cells that reveal tau tangles. You can also, um, again, you can do an MRI scan and see areas in which the brain damage has occurred. Um, I also want to mention that Alzheimer's is an active area of research, and it's also one that's not very well understood. I can proudly tell you from all of my research and training on Alzheimer's that there is distinctly between four and seven different stages of Alzheimer's. So <laughs> that, that's how solid it is right now as far as how we define what's happening. It is a stage progression. Again, there's four to seven stages in it. It progresses with slow progresses. It presents with slow progressive faculty loss. The most common symptoms are memory loss, impaired communication, and disorient disorientation and confusion. As the disease progresses, people develop difficulty swallowing, speaking, and walking. And this is what eventually somebody dies from from uh, Alzheimer's. Is either a a um what should I say here? A complication from one of those problems, pneumonia, dehydration and malnutrition, an infection, a severe injury from a fall, or uh, it brain the brain just degenerates enough that somebody eventually passes away from it. The model for it, and that's why it's up here. The model for Alzheimer's is. A onion. That's what people always use as a description of it. And what's lost, the, what is said is what's learned first is lost last. So people pre present over time. New information is very hard for an Alzheimer's patient to uh, to hold on to. So working with an Alzheimer's patient, you will probably have to introduce yourself every time. You will have to re-explain what's happening to them every time. And as the disease progresses, it's almost like they go back in time. People with severe Alzheimer's will forget that their children are adults. Uh, they may forget family members, like younger ones, like grandchildren. They may not recognize their spouse because they remember this person as a younger person. 
they will start looking for their parents because they've forgotten that they are no longer with us. They also will develop delusions. Um, whether this is a delusion of remember, like wanting mom and dad and they're not there, or whether it's a delusion of something else, it, it kind of depends. But delusions do progress. As the disease progresses, delusions are common. So, again, the two classic symptoms of Alzheimer's are tau tangles, which are the long twisted protein chains that are, again, we'll see coming up over and over again, and beta amyloid buildup, which are beta amyloids are protein fragments that build up outside of the neurons. And again, it's unclear if these are causes or byproducts or you know, side effects. We don't know. But we do know 100% that those are in much higher concentration in a patient with Alzheimer's than in somebody with a non-Alzheimer's brain. It's also a, a marked decrease in brain volume. You can see in the, in the diagram up there that the brain is just atrophied everywhere. And that is a classic, that's a classic symptom, or that, that is actually not even a classic symptom, that is dementia, is that degradation of parts of the brain. But with Alzheimer's, because it's such a slow progression, it's frequently much more marked than it is in other dementias. Uh, the second one we're going to discuss is front, frontal temporal dementia, or uh, FTD, as most people just call it. It's fairly rare. Uh, 50 to 60,000 cases are in the U.S. Uh, it strikes pretty early. 60% of cases are in people 45 to 60 years old. This is the um, frontal temporal is the de degeneration of the frontal and or temporal lobe. It's, we're not very creative on these names. Uh, if you remember back in your cast back again to AMP, uh, the frontal temporal area is the, right here, this is the area that's responsible for judgment, analysis, and behavior. It's also responsible for editing behaviors. Uh, so people with frontal temporal dementia will often struggle to, they can have a very normal conversation with you, but they sometimes struggle with cause and effect, with logical outcomes, with being able to see the likely outcome of a behavior. So there are two different types based on the area of degeneration. I'm not sure why types and quotes is, this is a legitimate types. Um, there's behavioral variant, frontal temporal, which is characterized by prominent changes in personality, relationships, or conduct. You will see this often in somebody who was a very sweet natured person, say, in, uh, in when they were younger. And then now they're brusque and rude and curse a lot. Um, Maybe they're a little more, I'm sorry, we're going to get in some, a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe they're a little more loose morally than they used to be. Maybe they're a little more happy with partner swapping. Um, this is one that families often struggle with, is watching this kind of behavior happen. The other kind is primary, pro primary progressive aphasia. Uh, this affects language skills, speaking, writing, and comprehension. And then we also break down further... PPA, because of course we do, we break down everything. Uh, there's the semantic variation of PPA, which, in which individuals lose the ability to understand or formulate words and spoken sentences. Then there's non-fluent agrammatic variation, in which speaking is very hesitant, labored, or ungrammatical. You can see in this case why it's so, why, why dementia can be so difficult to deal with on a nutritional level. Because, and again, we're not, when I say deal with it, we're not fixing dementia, but we're trying to maintain the nutrition of someone with dementia. It's very hard when you're working with somebody who has a combination of they can't remember things and or they can't reason well anymore. And also they can't talk very well and they can't understand things as well as they used to. Communication becomes very, very difficult. Here's a wall of text for you. A Lewy body disease. Um, it's a disease that involves Lewy bodies. Uh, the protein uh, is a protein called alpha syn. Oh man, alpha synleukin uh, builds up in the brain. I I know I butchered that, but I'm not going back because we do the one shot, one take. I wouldn't be able to go back in the classroom either. It typically manifests later than 50 years. 
at old, and there's about one to one and a half million people that suffer from it. Signs and symptoms uh, are visual hallucinations early in the course of dementia, sensitivity to, uh, to anti-hallucinogenics, fluctuations in cognitive ability, attention and alertness, and they have more trouble with complex mental tasks than memory. So Alzheimer's, remember the, the classic symptom of Alzheimer's is struggling with memory, they have memory loss, which makes it difficult to learn things. Uh, Lewy body dementia patients have trouble, they don't have trouble remembering, so they won't have a difficulty remembering who you are necessarily, but they do have a hard time with difficult tasks. So learning new things, keeping in mind what's going on, that's difficult for them. Uh, these hallucinations can be very, very vivid. Uh, it's one of the, and because they're, sen they're sensitive to anti-hallucinogenics, it's much harder to treat these hallucinations. Uh, the fluctuations of cognitive ability, attention, and alertness. So they can fade, fade in and out very quickly from something. And Parkinson's disease dementia is one I didn't really mention there. This doesn't... I have only really worked with a couple people that have this. Parkinson's di uh, disease dementia is exactly, again, what it sounds like. Physical symptoms manifest first, and that's typically what you will see in Parkinson's disease is the physical symptoms. Not all patients with Parkinson's will develop dementia. And again, all patients with Parkinson's appear to develop the physical symptoms before they develop dementia, if they do. There's no known trigger for for the dementia to occur. So it's completely, it feels completely arbitrary at this time as to who will develop it and not. Um, there's really not much I have for you on that one, except you will see this. Sometimes you'll see PDD noted in the chart. It's progressive disease, Parkinson's disease dementia, excuse me. Vascular dementia is, um, if you remember back to vascular wounds, it's similar to that or like heart disease. It's a deterioration of brain matter due to vascular insufficiency. Vascular dementia is a little less clearly defined because it can attack any part of the brain. It's almost a se separate causal, blah, almost a separate causal descriptor rather than a specific disease because similar to other functions or other arterial diseases, say cardiovascular diseases, this is more about what is being attacked or what's, what's having blood blocked to it more than it is a specific region. So what are the risks now that I've terrorized you with, uh, with this outcome of dementia? Um, familial and genetic components, very clearly there's a genetic component to uh, dementia. People with a, and this works just like every other disease, people with a family history of dementia have a higher risk of dementia. The closer that family re relation is to the patient, the higher the risk is. So you know, a sibling that developed it, a parent that developed it, much higher risk. If you have grandparents, aunts and uncles, less high risk, but still high. Black and Hispanic ancestry seems to be a risk factor. Not completely sure why that's the case, but it probably relates to the fact that black and Hispanic ancestry also has a higher rate of diabetes risk. And let me skip one here, come back. Um, diabetes is directly a risk factor for developing dementia. Some people refer to dementia as specifically as type 3 diabetes. That is how strong the link appears to be. Do we know why? You, you've done this long enough now. Of course, of course, we don't know why. We're not sure why. Uh, but it does seem to be the case. There is, in fact, some literature and some advice that... Um, Controlling hyperglycemia may help slow or prevent de, um, dementia progression or development. A, ser a history of strokes is a risk factor for dementia. And then, as we saw earlier, age is a risk factor for dementia as well. Now, interestingly, um, one thing that appears to uh, I would say dilute was the first word that came to mind, and that's not correct. Mitigate, perhaps somewhat, uh, is a education level appears to make a difference in dementia. The more educated somebody is, it appears that 
this is a this helps prevent dementia. Um, college gra within college graduates, about five and a half percent of patients develop. Let me back up a second. Five and a half percent of patients with a college education will develop dementia. That goes up to with some college and graduate college went to college. It's six percent. A high school education is eleven percent, and less than a high school education is almost twenty percent. Um, and there's also some evidence that being cognitively active reduces risk. So people that continue to learn, that do things like read, do crosswords, play musical instruments, learn languages, anything that engages your brain appears to reduce the risk. Then we have a theory on that. We don't know why that's the case. Oh, I'm sorry, bumped that early. We're not, we're not gonna go back. Uh, the theory is that because your brain is working on new neural pathways as it learns new things, it is able to reroute circuitry, if you will, to avoid an area of the brain that is degenerating. That's kind of the working theory on that. Okay, so I'm sorry, now let's go on to medications. Um, there are no known cures for dementia. There are some medications that may slow progression. And I think it's worth seeing these, knowing these, because you will see these in, uh, in geriatric patients. There we go. Um, Aricept is, is one of them. That, the Aricept is for more advanced dementia. Uh, it's brand, Aricept's a brand name. Generic is Donepazil. Rivastigamine, Memantine, and Galantamine are all kind of for early to mid dementia. Uh, brand names here are Exelon. Namenda and Reminil. I will tell you, I see Namenda most commonly, and I'm not sure if that's because it's the least expensive or if it's the most, uh, if it's the, the, the preferred one. I'm, I'm really not sure. Uh, oftentimes, you'll see these given together because, again, uh, say, Memantine is given for early to mid-stage dementia. Aricept is given for late or mid to late stage, because there's no set standard on what dementia levels are, it's fairly common to see both of them prescribed at the same time to kind of catch all the bases. A lot like antipsychotic medications, the mechanism is not well understood at this time. Continue, please. There we go. So, uh, MNT. If you remember back to when we talked about macronutrients way back. Dementia patients are at extremely high risk for developing malnutrition. This is for a couple of reasons. Because, um, because they can't learn, if you will. It uh, uh, sounds so, so tacky to say. Because they are, the, because they have challenges though, and develop and learning new skills, it's hard to do nutrition counseling for somebody like that. Uh, because they can't remember, initially they don't remember if they, they get to the point where they don't remember if they've eaten. Uh, they may try to eat more than once. As things progress, they, as this disease progresses, they, they start losing their appetite. Also, they may develop, if they develop delusions or hallucinations, the food may look bad or smell bad to them. They may have some sort of hallucination uh, I have heard people say that the plate looks like maggots. Um, I've had people believe that we're trying to poison them. And again, unlike with psychological disorders, there is no way to bring somebody back from that. All you can do is remind them and then try to find a new tack. Because this is such a individualized disease process, the interventions also have to be very individualized and tailored to the patient. Some of the common uh, interventions are divided plates and plate guards, weighted wear or built up wear and brightly colored contrasting plates and silverware and uh, placemats. Uh, other suggestions, and we are gonna get more of these. We're, we're, this is just kind of an overview. Uh, to limit distractions. Um, one of the things that uh, people struggle with often, like families do, is that you know, we often have 
we'll often have something else going on while we eat. We'll have like something playing in the background, whether it's, excuse me, music or we're streaming Netflix or whatever. Something else is going on. I will bet money that one of you is eating something right now while you're watching this. Okay, I have no idea if any of you are, but I bet somebody is. Um, so because they have a limited amount of cognition ability, if you will, it helps to limit distractions. Turn off, uh, turn off ambient noises and make sure that the focus is on eating. Uh, finger foods are foods that can be eaten on the go. If you have somebody who is forgetful, you can, if you can put something in their hand, they will often eat it. It's kind of a reflex action. Smaller, more frequent meals. Maybe they can't focus long enough to remember to eat a whole three-course meal, but if you can put a small amount of food in front of them, they'll eat that, bring it back, do it again later. Um, that may be more successful. Sweet. Now, this is, again, not 100% literature driven. This is a little bit more anecdotal within the gerontology community. Uh, sweetness. Sweet appears to be the, seems to be the first taste we develop and the last taste we lose. So if you can provide something that tastes sweet, you have a much better chance of having somebody with severe dementia eating that. I know it sounds gross, but I have poured honey or maple syrup on an entire plate before and the patient has eaten that. It doesn't matter what it is. It, it tastes sweet to them, and they will eat it. Yeah, there are times you have to just let your preconceived notions on these things go. And this is, again, one of those times when oral supplements may be in order. Again, again because they're sweet and because they can be held and carried around with them, oral supplements are a really good intervention for people with dementia. I, I, and it's interesting that we're like, so often we're saying food first, food first. No, no, no. I feel like the last two times I've been like, yeah, no, supplements may work really, really well. The last thing to discuss here is um, dementia and uh, nutrition support. It's not very common that you'll have somebody in, geri in a geriatric situation go to uh, TPN. That just doesn't happen that often. It can. And if that's the case, it's still, this still holds true. Okay. But the more common approach is enteral nutrition. And according to the Geriatric Society, uh, the preponderance of the evidence does not support enteral nutrition use. Uh, the AND and Aspen do not recommend nutrition support for geriatric patients with dementia. It doesn't appear to, move, to uh, change outcomes at all. It does seem to make their numbers more numbery, if you will. Um, by that, I mean they may have better lab values, but quality of life doesn't seem to be improved at all. And so you need to consider quality of life for the patient and what the patient and the family want to do at this point. And that's leading us into our next point, which is when we come back to this, we're going to be discussing hospice care and end of life care. That is dementia. I will see you guys next time. Bye.